on the agenda, we were going to hear about the um, decision uh, related to uh, Portland land use. This is, a, this is a case we've been following for a while, and we're excited and then disappointed, and I think we can be excited again now. Um, Nick, Caleb, Center for Sustainable Economy, are you on the line? I'm here. Great. Can you, uh, can you tell us the latest? And for, for folks who may not have been following it as closely, can you give us just a little background on uh, Portland's land use um, policy and sort of how we got here? Absolutely. Um, so the briefest sort of background I can give, and if people want a little bit more, feel free to ask questions in a, in a minute. But um, in Portland, we had a lot of organizations and advocates who had been working in fossil fuel terminal resistance and, and transport resistance. We didn't have anything in Portland for a long time. And then in 2014, a uh, gas terminal was proposed, a propane gas terminal was proposed, large investment, folks mobilized. We ended up beating it basically because of a land use technicality. Um, and in the wake of that mobilization, we're able to convince our city to first pass a resolution opposing new fossil fuel infrastructure, and then later land use code restricting uh, fossil fuel infrastructure. So to our knowledge, this is the first example of that happening anywhere in the country, at least in the comprehensive way that it happened in Portland. And so just to give you a little bit of an understanding of what that was, um, we created a new land use category called bulk fossil fuel terminals, which is characterized by either marine railroad or pipeline transport access and storage capacity of over 2 million gallons equivalents of, of basically oil, um, or it has transloading facilities. So if you're moving from your, your fossil fuel substance from rail to ship or um, likewise. So we also prevented the expansion of existing fossil fuel infrastructure. So there's, there's quite a bit in Portland in the Northwest industrial area. And so we restricted that. Um, there would be no expansion to that. So it's a big deal. We were really excited about it. Um, we got sued months after it was implemented um, by the Portland Business Alliance, which is our, our local chamber of commerce, the Western States Petroleum Association, and the Columbia Pacific Buildings Trades, um, and a group called Working Waterfront intervened. We got sued in land use court, um, the Land Use Board of Appeals in Oregon, and the arguments against the code were that it violated several land use laws, uh, state land use laws, but also the big one was that it violated the U.S. Constitution um, through the Dormant Commerce Clause. And so we had kind of a strange decision out of the, the um, Land Use Board of Appeals where we lost. Uh, only one of three hearings officers participated in that ruling. Um, the other two recused themselves, which is very strange. And um, so we ended up losing on a couple of land use issues, and then the big one was the constitutional issue, which, you know, we've been working, as CSCA and some of our partners have been working to try to, to work with our partners around the country to start experimenting with these codes. And so that put a lot of, that threw sort of cold water on that effort. And folks said, well, you know, what's the point of engaging in this? The courts are going to actually just overturn our, our local regulations on the basis of the U.S. Constitution. And so um, the city of Portland voted to appeal that decision. Um, and then the Center for Sustainable Economy, where I work, um, along with Columbia Riverkeeper and uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, the Oregon Chapter, and Portland Audubon, we intervened in the, in the appeal as well, um, and Craig Law Center represented us. So uh, in a pretty quick turnaround, um, the, the case was filed in August, our appeal was filed in August. We got our decision in January, and um, the constitutional... Uh, ruling at the at Luba was overturned. So our Court of Appeals issued a very clear decision saying, look, the Dormant Commerce Clause does not mean what Luba thought it meant, um, and or the city of Portland is not, they're not forbidden by the U.S. Constitution from establishing these codes. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of an a overview of what the Dormant, Dormant Commerce Clause is in a sec here. Um, so as it stands, um, we're in a position where um, so we found out this morning that um, fossil fuel industry is going to petition the Oregon Court of Appeals for 
uh, reconsideration of its decision. Um, Craig, our, our attorneys, don't think it has much merit. So we'll see what the appeals process looks like. Um, theoretically, it could go to the Supreme Court, the Oregon Supreme Court, and then the appeals beyond that. Um, but for the time being, um, restrictions of the kind on fossil fuel infrastructure that Portland passed do not violate the Dormant Commerce Clause. So um, I wanted to just touch briefly on what the Dormant Commerce Clause is so that folks that are kind of in this area of being in local communities where new infrastructure is coming through and they're thinking about restrictions but are kind of hearing a little bit of, you know, pushback, we don't want to get sued and lose, I'll give you a little bit of an idea what it is. So the Dormant Commerce Clause is kind of the flip side of the normal Commerce Clause in Article One, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution that gives Congress the power to regulate commerce. So the Dormant Commerce Clause says that states are not allowed to discriminate against different forms of commerce. And discrimination here means that they can't bias their rules to protect in-state or local commerce at the expense of out-of-state commerce. So it's a way of sort of having uniformity of, of commerce rules um, to allow economics to go and impede it. Um, so the argument against our restrictions was that um, basically, I mean, it was, it was not a great argument in our opinion, but basically that, look, this obviously affects interstate commerce because they're saying no new terminals and that's going to slow the growth of this industry. And so that just blatantly violates the Dormant Commerce Clause. Um, we thought that was a poor argument. The Oregon Court of Appeals agreed. They said, nope, you're expanding the definition of what is contained in this area of, of law. We're restricting it just to this question of, are you discriminating against in-state interests, out-state interests? Uh, Portland doesn't really have in-state fossil fuel interests, so how could there be discrimination? was basically the answer. And then the second piece of the opinion um, said to the extent that there is any kind of incidental effect um, on interstate commerce, the city's reasons for establishing the code outweigh those effects. And so when the city of Portland passed its code, it relied on the harms of the fossil, protecting residents from the harms of the fossil fuel industry. So those are, um, the fact that large fossil fuel terminals leak and explode, um, and we in the Pacific Northwest live in an area where we're expecting an earthquake, a big earthquake at any time, and this would massively increase the risk of this, these, the dangers of this industry, and so we wanted to put a cap on that risk, basically. Um, so that was considered a legitimate interest. Um, the court also said that the public health um, uh, problems associated with certain fossil fuels, so for example, coal as heavy metals that are linked to cancer and birth defects and other things. They said that regulating that was a piece of a legitimate interest. Um, and then the court also especially noted that um, the city of Portland's reliance on the Mosier disaster, the Mosier oil spill, as sort of our wake-up call and reason for wanting to do that was also part of a legitimate interest. So they said, look, when we take all of these things together, um, Portland has adequate reason to establish these, this code. So anyway, um, really, really good decision for us locally. Um, as soon as we get the appeal situation figured out and, you know, sort out what the business alliance and the fossil fuel industry are doing as far as appeals go, the city of Portland will start to start a process to re-implement the ban. Um, they've got to cure a couple of land use issues. They've got to make some more findings of fact, but basically we've heard from the mayor and also the city attorney that they're really committed to reinstating the code. So in the next month ahead, we'll be returning back to the city of Portland to, to make sure that that ban is up and running. In the meantime, other communities that have sort of taken a look at Portland's ban have been curious about that. We think that this gives a little bit, this should give you a little bit more confidence about exploring it more deeply. Um, of course, you know, you got to pay attention to your local code and um, your zoning code and your state laws. And, you know, there are preemptions that exist in different states. But in terms of that big constitutional question, this is a real, this is the first time that a court, uh, a proper court, not a land use court, has ruled on the co 
constitutional question, and so far so good. So it's a good signal to other folks around the country.